Take my bride, let's go for a ride in my new fangled automobile. This where we will go. Nobody knows, but it's sure a great way to feel. Behind the wheel of the speed me to steal, it's my new fangled automobile. Hello and welcome to Vintage Car History. I'm Wild Bill. And yes, I have said in the past that Queen Victoria was not a fan of cars. She never owned one, drove one, or even rode in one. So it comes as no surprise that despite so many makes and models of cars named after her, she was never involved in any company that actually made them. But just because you live in the Victorian era and, like the Queen, don't like cars, doesn't mean that you're not willing to make a buck with them. Which brings up the topic of Alexander de Rock. Born in Bordeaux, France, into a Basque family in 1855, young Alex was an energetic young man with a keen mind for business and mathematics. He trained as a draftsman in the city of Tarbes, which at the time was host to a new company building artillery pieces. Called the Arsenal by the locals, he cut his engineering eye teeth there and built a reputation as both a gifted designer and a keen opportunist. In the early 1880s, Alexander received an offer to work for a company way north from home, the Hertu Firm. Now, Hertu was a new company founded in 1880 but well-funded and expanding into many markets. They started out making sewing machines, which is the department young Alex started in. He put his mathematical mind to work and came up with a new design of sewing machine. Indeed, his machine won a gold medal for innovation at the Paris World Fair of 1889. Yet at the same time, the company started making machine tools, lathes, presses, and various dyes. Next, they expanded into bicycles, which was all the rage in the 1880s, becoming a significant player in the French cycling scene. And Mr. Dirac saw all of this happen and took notes. He left the company, headed out to a suburb of Paris, and founded the Gladiator Cycle Company in 1891. His bikes were immediately recognized as being well-designed, well-made, and reasonably affordable, making Alex a wealthy man. He sold his company in 1896 and, with a very big bag of cash on hand, looked around for his next opportunity. Later that year, he chose to manufacture electric cars, establishing his car company, Dorak. He chose as his offering to the unsuspecting public an electric taxicab. The car had perhaps a 35-mile range on a charge, but charging stations were not particularly available. Thus, the car would be spending more time charging than actually generating fares. This first venture into the motor car was, by his own admission, a fast failure. The car itself being declared by himself worthless. But old Alex wasn't ready to throw in the towel. Internal combustion engines were the way to go in his book, so over the next year he began to make a few small gas-powered vehicles, cycle cars of both three and four wheels. At the same time, he looked around and noticed that Leon Belay had some very juicy design patents and spent the money to get a license to manufacture them. The result was a new car, the Dirac Belay. Now, Alexander himself was not a fan of cars. He did take a few driving lessons in 1896, mostly so he'd know how to operate one if he had to for promotional reasons, but his passion was for business, not cars. This approach to car manufacture reared its ugly head in this new car produced with the Boli license. It was just about undrivable. This belt-driven car had a decent engine, but the rest of the drivetrain was unreliable and also couldn't handle either the road or the engine's power. Mr. Duroc took note of this and began to look around France and elsewhere to find for his company good ideas and good engineers and it paid off. By 1900, de Rock had designed and produced their own four-wheeled car. This Voiturette was much like the contemporary Renault, six-cylinder, six-and-a-half horsepower, three-speed transmission, and a shaft drive. However, it was bigger than their competitors and also had something they didn't, a foot-operated accelerator. 
Thus, Alexander put the pedal to the metal and pumped out cars in earnest. He was among the first automotive pioneers to begin mass production. The demand for his cars would take many skilled laborers many hours to complete, but if he just used machines to make the parts, as well as buy parts from other companies, then his workers would only have to assemble them together, which takes less time and expertise. Also, by mechanizing his factory, he, like Henry Leland, could maintain a higher level of quality and consistency in the process. By 1904, his company was responsible for over 10% of all cars manufactured in France. His team of engineers were designing excellent cars that sold well, as well as cars for the races, and even land speed record breaking. Alexandre Duroc's automotive exploits reached across Europe and elsewhere, and we have a lot to talk about those exploits in the future. He founded companies in England, Germany, Italy. Wherever he could make money in cars, he went and made money. And yes, it's true. This Frenchman that didn't like cars is the man that went and founded the Italian company that would become known as Alfa Romeo. Thanks for watching Vintage Car History, and we'll see you next week. Peace.